A good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all viewers from all around the world. My name is Frank van Driest from the Institute for Real Growth, and I welcome you to the Humanized Growth Series. And our guests today are Iris Meyer and Vinut Kumar, respectively the CMO and CEO of Vodafone Business. Hello, Iris. Hello, Vinut. Um, let me start by asking where you are in these pandemic times, and especially with your background, uh, Iris, that's, uh, that's not uh, entirely clear always. Iris? Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Frank. I I'm really delighted to be here. So I am uh, at home uh, in London, uh, originally from Finland. So, uh, and also Frank knows I have ties to the Netherlands as well. So you never know where I am. But uh, today I'm home in London um, and actually I am very, very excited because I just finished a juice detox. That was three days. Uh, I know it uh, doesn't sound much, but uh, boy, I needed the coffee this morning. So I think I am lucky, but you are lucky as well that this uh, our, our webinar wasn't yesterday. So <laughs> During your detox, well, good to hear that. And Vinut, where are you? Uh, Frank, I'm at home in uh, Kensington in London, so actually not too far from it is, but I will be staying very far from any juice detox. <laughs> I think it wouldn't be good for my system or my mood. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Hey, so um, we're going to, we have an hour and we're going to, to focus mainly on three topics. Um, the CEO CMO collaboration, because this is a unique setup with two guests at the same time. Secondly, how to be commercially driven, customer insight centric and purpose led at the same time. And then thirdly, what this takes for leadership. And, and, and I wanted to do, it's a little bit different to usually is I wanted to start up, start with a little warm up. So I have a couple of multiple choice questions for you, um, A, B or C in most cases. So, um, Vinod, let me start with you. Uh, you're the CEO of the company. Iris is the CMO of the company. How often do you meet one-on-one um, -on -one with, uh, with uh, Iris? Is that daily? Is that weekly? Or is that monthly? Uh, B, weekly. Weekly. At okay. least, right? Somewhere between that, but weekly would be the definite answer. And then the Irish. At least weekly, I'm being uh, 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 sending Vinod messages. I need you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the next question is for you, Iris. Um, the answer that uh, that uh, Vinod gave is that uh, more often than you like, less often than you like, or exactly the right the right cadence. I it's think okay, it's exactly it is, the right. You can right. say it. Uh, <laughs> say the truth. I, I can't really say anything else, right? But I think it's exactly right. But I think it also depends what's going on because sometimes it can be daily and sometimes it can be a little bit like, you know, only week basis or something like that. It depends what's going on. Okay, good. Iris... Uh, you won't another, get rid of me, so... <laughs> another one for you. Um, and and we, we, the, all the, uh, the, the warm-up questions are obviously related to the topics we'll go much more in depth in, but just to get a feel for it. So what is most important to you, Iris Meyer, that Vodafone business is commercially driven, that is customer centric, or that it's purpose led? Wow, yeah, I could choose all three of them, but um, I think it all comes down to customer centric um, because I think you can be customer centric and purpose driven at the same time, but I would say customer centric. <laughs> Hopefully, Vino thinks I passed the test now. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no, no good or right. Maybe I should have said it right from the start, but uh, no, definitely not. Um, Vinut, in your last town hall, or basically where you grew, uh, spoke to, to a large audience, uh, internal or external, which of the following three words did did you mention most? When was it, by the way, your, your last town hall? Uh, probably as many one yesterday with Iris's team, actually, but um, okay. maybe a bigger one was uh, sometime last week. Okay, so, so if you keep that one in mind, mm -hmm. what was the word that you used most often of the following three in that town hall? Was it 
profit? Was that customer or was that purpose? Um, customer. Customer. Yeah. You're quite aligned here. Yeah. Um, two more, and then we go into the uh, real conversation. Finut, leadership, we're going to talk about. As a leader in the past year, who did you learn, learn from most? Your colleagues, your family, or other people? Um, my colleagues. Um, and we'll talk more about it later, but definitely learned a lot from my colleagues, uh, especially those who we serve in the organization. Um, learned a lot from them. And Iris, as a leader, who did you impact most in the last year? Your colleagues, your family, or your customers? Um, I would say customers. Um, yeah, I would say customers. Great, good, good. <laughs> Good. Thank you for those uh, for that warm up, and we probably come back to quite a few of the things that were mentioned here. Um, and uh, there's plenty of time uh, for that. Uh, Iris, um, uh, you were a participant in the IRG 100 uh, leadership program. That's that's how this connection uh, came about. Um, you've now been at Photophone for three years, and prior to you worked at Nokia, right? For how long was that? Uh, that was about nine years. What was the what was the most important skill that you brought from Nokia and 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 could bring to work at Photophone? Um, I think it's uh, data driven marketing. That's that's that was uh, yeah I know a, a peak in your profile and that was what was really helpful. Great, good. Uh, Vinod, you've been at Photophone for about a year and a half, That's and right. before that you did a very long stint at Tata, right? That's right. So I, I thought about that, um, and, and I thought a year and a half is a really interesting period of time. Because on the one hand, you have the time to, you know, a year and a half, you'll have made your first impact. And at the same time, it's a year and a half, you still have a relatively fresh perspective. Um, can you give an example of both? Example of a... Um, of where you made impact and where yeah, you still actually really bring a fresh perspective. Yeah, the, the fresh perspective uh, that I feel I've brought to the role is um, the journey at um, at Tata was from um, being the first employee, employee to create the international business and then growing it to a large business. So it was very much like a startup. So um, in, in, in Vodafone, they're a challenger for sure, but uh, I'd like us to be more of a fighter and, a, and, and have more of a startup feel. So um, that's probably um, the perspective that I brought, which is to think really out of the box, to think more assertively in terms of market positioning and to bring you know, um, more of a hustle to, the, to, 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 to our uh, strategy as well as evolution. Um, you can separately ask it is how, how successful that uh, perspective has been, but I think I've tried to bring that. Yeah. Um, and um, on impact, uh, it's still early days and you know, we have very high ambitions for what we want to do, but I feel as a team, we are, um, you know, able to uh, play much better together and, and play in different positions, depending on the situation, rather than being too hung up to, on what our title or role or previous position was. So there's definitely all of us feel more vibrancy uh, at my leadership team and even the wider uh, organization. Um, to be adaptable to the situation and role play accordingly. Great, good, good. Um, well, I said we're going to talk about, you know, focus this conversation on three topics. And, and as you know, as I told you ahead of this conversation, after about 20 minutes, half, to, half an hour or so, I'll, I'll start taking uh, questions uh, from the audience, uh, if there's any, but there'll undoubtedly be. But I first wanted to talk about this, this CEO and CMO collaboration. Um, I think the most critical word in that is expectations, alignment of expectations. Um, 
it's a shocking uh, statistic from Spencer Stewart that the average tenure of a CMO is only a third of that of a CFO. We can, there's a whole lot to say about it. It also has to do with maybe the curiosity uh, and, and adventure mindset of CMOs, but definitely also because uh, there is in many cases, you know, trouble in aligning what you expect of marketing, what CEOs and leadership team can expect of a marketing and of a CMO in particular. Um, well, I, I, knowing uh, Iris quite well now, I, I'm absolutely sure she, uh, she will beat that average tenure uh, by quite a bit. But, uh, but I want to start with you, uh, Vinut, is, is just hear about your expectations of marketing as a function and of Iris as the leader of that function. Okay, so um, rather than sort of describe um, the expectations of marketing per se, let me just step back a little bit and give you my uh, thoughts on what I think the role of marketing is, right? yeah. especially in today's context. Yeah. So I see marketing really sitting at two very important intersections. Um, and one is the intersection of external views and perspectives and internal perceptions and internal views, mm -hmm. right? So uh, th th that's one really crucial intersection that marketing sits bang in the middle of. The other role that marketing plays, especially in a tech company like ours, is marketing is sitting at the intersection of our products and, and, the, and the channels to market. So it's a bit of an internal perspective. So the product organization that is looking at competition, looking at technology, so on and so forth. And then you have the various channels to market that we use to take our products and services uh, to the customer. So marketing is sit at, sitting in the middle of these two intersections, not playing you know, a, a cop role, but essentially can moderate the traffic and to actually make the communication flow well, needs be understood. Um, you know, uh, sorry, can you just, just ask to clarify because you said something very different than I expected. You said between product and the channels, I expected you'd say between product and the customer. But yeah, so I'm saying so the, the, that is the customer view is addressed in the earlier point, which is on external and internal, right? Yeah. So, and then you, th that's one role, clearly hearing what the customer is doing, competition is doing, what the analysts are so, uh, um, saying about us and how they see the landscape, so on and so forth. And then you have an internal reality. So that's one intersection. The other intersection is much more an internal intersection, which is you have your sales teams, your channels to market, and then you have your product and engineering organizations creating things for them to take to market. There's a you know, crucial role that marketing plays in, in both of those. And the, what the marketing organization needs to keep in mind is how do you leverage this position when you're sitting in these intersections to drive commercial outcomes that are aligned with the overall strategy of the company, the financial objectives of the company, the contributions we want to make to the larger society, which will come to uh, separately. Uh, and it, it's not just sitting there as and, and witnessing the traffic flow. It is actually aiding the speed at which the traffic flows and where we get competitive advantage from it. And then obviously from all of that, you know, you come with, you know, what would be, have been a traditional marketing organization's focus, which is when you have this insight and you translate it into activities and programs that drive commercial outcomes, then how do you create the right brand association with the relevant stakeholders, internal, external, you know, that your immediate customers, your policy makers, your uh, um, uh, regulators, larger society, so on and so forth. And it's really important in this that marketing creates uh, communication that is both congruent, but also amplifies the strategy of the business, right? So, and being aware of that strategy and making it amplified is really important because sometimes you can get really carried away with the brand without understanding why you're amplifying the brand. And that's why I'm highlighting this congruence with strategy. And then the last bit, I think the, the uh, role that marketing plays uh, in my view is taking all stakeholders along, right? And, and the nuance in that is making sure that we choose the right language, the right platform, the right tonality, depending on the audience. Because today are the audiences that we have to appeal to and address and, and so on um, are very diverse, right? And it's not a one size fits all. So marketing also needs to have 
the, the, the you know, understanding of those nuances and make sure that um, it is, um, there's no spillage, right? Because we also have limited resources and efficiency is super important. So I'd say as a function, these are, you know, you know the things that I'm expecting from, uh, from you know, uh, marketing. Now within that, obviously the CMO plays a crucial role. And so um, to Iris, for example, I would look to say, are you putting marketing in all the relevant business flows and the right internal and external conversations? Because in a large organization like Vodafone, you have multiple stakeholders, you have different lines of business, you have lots of things going on, right? It's not, everything can't just be completely scripted or a process written for it or a three clicks of a button and you get a beautiful report. Even in a, an awesome company like Vodafone, we don't have that, right? So it is, how do you keep your year on the ground? How are you like scanning the horizon externally? How are you looking at, you know, the internal, you know, uh, evolutions of the organization and make sure marketing is in the right conversations. So you need to have that e almost ESP to it. Behind that, there's a suitable organization structure and then, uh, you know, a relevant talent bench. We'll talk about that probably a little bit um, um, uh, uh, later, right? Because depending on where you are in a business life cycle, product life cycle, the needs of the talent bench within marketing is also going to evolve and how you staff that, you've got to be creative and you've got to be very nimble. Uh, and, and then the last one would be, um, it's an amplification of what I just said is in a multi-product, multi-segment business, it's, it, it's not a single mode, it's not even bimodal, it is multi-modal, right? Every business, you, you, we are, we'll be incubating a business and launching a new concept where you have to market, the role of marketing will be very different from uh, a, a big established multi-billion euro revenue business stream that still needs marketing, but a very different kind of support. Well, that's, uh, that's an impressive uh, list of expectations uh, of both the role, but, but also of you, Iris. Um, and, um, and so to deliver on all of these expectations, you need to bring quite a lot as a person also. What do you feel are the, are the most important, what's the most important skill or trait that you bring that enables you to deliver on, on all of these expectations? Um, I don't think there's one skill that enables to deliver all of the expectations, but I think as a marketer in general, um, obviously it's amazing to have a CEO who considers marketing important. So let's start with that. And, and, and then delivering on the expectations, I, I think one of the very key areas is that the in engagement. So engaging your team with energy and engaging with all the stakeholders, like we not said, and, 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 and Vodafone is, is, is still a quite federated organization. So you really need to engage the uh, um, um, organization in the operating companies, in our uh, group stakeholders, in the product lines, uh, in sales, and then really bring your team together as well. And I think Without that, you will get nowhere. So it's extremely important to have the stakeholder alignment, but also have the energy and try to push it forward. So, okay, let's talk about that, the stakeholder alignment. In my view, the way I see it pretty universally in marketing, it is the marketer's role to basically what we call in our leadership program, as you well know, Iris, to decode the world. To, to basically represent the perspectives and the needs and wants of all different stakeholders. Now, uh, undoubtedly, and, and we spoke about that, that's, that, that's, that's a, an area of passion for you. Um, what do you do to ensure that, that people also embrace the perspectives and the, the opportunities uh, that, that you that you identify and then, and then communicate to all these different stakeholders, what makes them listen to you? Well, you said, and, and, and I would agree that it's marketing roles to represent all the stakeholders, but the main role I see marketing having is actually to represent our customers. 
Yeah, so yeah. it's one of the stakeholders in my view, right? So fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. So I think marketing's role is really to represent the customer internally. And, and to your point, like how do you then ensure that, for example, the internal stakeholders are aligned and, and, and understand? I think data is really important part of this. Um, data and insight and really bringing actionable insight to the organization, but also using the data and insight to deliver something that adds value to the customers. So I think you can see it both ways, uh, but I think data is absolutely at the core. Can you, can you give an example of uh, just a recent example out of your work where you said you brought data and you translated into actionable insights that really made an impact? No, absolutely. Uh, le let me just take a step back because I think what, what's important here is that um, quite like in the marketing world, people talk about data all the time. And sometimes it's seen this kind of like big monster and, and it's almost kind of like the data is driving us, the technology is driving us. But I think we need to take control and we need to see what is important. When I joined uh, Vodafone Business three years ago, um, we, my team was actually saying that we don't have any data. But actually, we had so much data. We had so much first party data, but also third party data. But the challenge is that quite often it's quite fragmented and disparate. So really understanding the data and making it to your question actionable insight is almost impossible so we've been working really really hard to bring that data together but also have fantastic research and, and different kind of research programs to really give us deeper insight so that that drives actions and to your point like an example so we are um, in our business 2025 strategy really serving our, our smaller businesses and becoming their champion and serving them in all their digital needs uh, is really, really important and is one of the biggest drivers. So what we've done is we've actually uh, um, researched over 10,000 small businesses across our markets to really understand what are their needs and, and, and what they need from us. And based on that one, We've uh, created a strategy, but also we've created propositions for them that are actually related to their needs rather than just our products. So we have a completely different mindset when we go to the market. And we were, it's early days, but, but we were just actually testing some of the propositions with our customers. And it was wonderful uh, to hear like some of the feedback. One of the customers said, wow, now I believe the Vodafone is actually understanding me. And that's what you want. It's uh, hard to, uh, to argue with that you want our customers to say that uh, for sure. Uh, th th that sounds uh, great, uh, Iris. Uh, Vinod, I, I, it's, I, it, was, it was clear what you said, the expectations. Um, and by Iris' answer, um, marketing is doing a good job in delivering on those expectations. Uh, but uh, no company is perfect and nor will Photophone business be perfect. If you had a magic wand, what, what would you change in marketing and what, what would they really step up to, uh, to, to, to drive further on the, to deliver further on the, on the ambitions of the Photophone business? Yeah, so uh, we've made remarkable progress as I uh, as just said on the uh, customer insights, right? And, and deepening our understanding. And that's going to be a journey that we will keep going on and learning more and more about our customers and get into the specifics. Equally on the other side of the journey, which is probably where we as a team need to do more work on is create um, a, a team of people who understand our technology and our products equally well. And, with, and then you have magic that happens, which is you bring the the customer insights to the technology's capability, and then you can present it in a way that delivers the right value, the right business outcomes, and you know whatever you want to call it. But that depth of understanding of the technology, the products, what is possible, what is not, is is the area that we probably need to uh, need to keep working on even more. Which is again a non-trivial exercise because of the big shelf of products that we have. So getting expertise in those areas. Um, is, is the journey that we're on right now. So to what extent is, let's say, your answer in, or, or 
trying to change, bring about that change, is that that could be a change in an operating model, for example. Right? So you work in a more mm -hmm. agile way or uh, with more cross-functional teams. It could be, you could seek the answer, uh, trying to drive that change through a culture change, um, maybe opening up the company with, with more, becoming more part of an ecosystem. What do you feel will be the biggest contributor to making this happen? Well, like you said, it's it's a combination of things. There's no one silver bullet. So we have our, have made changes to our operating model, uh, both um, at, within our product organization and how we work across markets and how we align ourselves. We've also made changes in Eris's marketing organization to place more emphasis on you know, segment-specific proposition creation, right? So we've done that. Um, and there's a cultural um, uh, evolution in the business. We adopted a new platform for our culture, which we want to, uh, which we're driving in order to become more like a tech company. It's called Spirit. Uh, and key elements of that are customer centricity, as well as getting things done together, which is the new way of working. And, and also on um, experimenting and learning fast, right? So we have to be ready to do things, fail, learn from those failures. So it's those combinations. But a third part of it is also the talent mix, right? Which is we have to look at the profile of the talent that we have and through a combination of reskilling and upskilling of existing talent, but also infusion of skills from outside where required, we have to have people who can make these pivots fairly quickly. So it's not, you know, in, in none of these, we have the luxury of time to do it serially, sequentially, and five years later, presto, we'll have something. That presto has to happen right now, mm -hmm. right? So um, that, that, that urgency is something that I don't want to sugarcoat. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so the, the second topic I said is, is being, you know, the, having the ambition to be both, both commercially driven customer centric and purpose led at the same time. So I guess the, the essence here is trade-offs, right? Because everybody wants everything and that's, that's never actually really possible. But let's first dissect them a little bit and unpack each of the three. Commercially driven, uh, Iris, what's that mean actually? What do you mean with that? I think Vinod mentioned about our focus on the commercial outcomes as well. So I, I think it's really, really important. Uh, and I think, of course, business is always uh, somewhat commercially driven, but for marketing, uh, uh, especially now where we are at Vodafone from business, of course, marketing can have different stages depending on the company stage as well. But we're, what's really, really important for us is to understand the commercials and being commercially driven. Vino was talking about how marketing needs to understand the technology and build these propositions. And I mentioned the propositions as well. You cannot build propositions if you don't understand the commercial, if you're not commercially driven. Obviously, you need to focus on the customer outcomes, but you also need to understand what is the market landscape and, and how it will actually impact the cost, uh, the actual business. So, so what I always find an interesting one in, in, in telco land is... Um, and uh, that's, I think, also pretty universal, is the focus on acquiring new customers. Uh, that the commercial focus is a lot on acquiring the 15% you're afraid might be sure. But the 85% of happy customers typically don't get, get, just get less attention because they're based, it's basically a safe turnover. How do you, how do you look at that? that tension, because I think it's a logical tension. I mean, it makes total sense that that tension exists. How do you look at that from a commercial perspective, uh, Iris? I think what we focus on, I understand where you're coming from. Uh, 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 we are focused, of course, acquiring customers as well, but we've had massive focus in our existing base. And then you can understand, especially to pick a scope of the pandemic, We've really focused on serving our existing customers the best we can and really ensuring that they have what they need. So I think uh, 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 from our perspective, I think the focus has really been serving the existing customers. And in the end of the day, of course, when you do that, you are able to upscale, upsell and, and cross sell, which is absolutely critical for the business as well. So I think first and foremost, you need to serve your existing customers the best way you can 
and then you have the right to start acquiring new customers as well. I don't know. Just, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, if I can just build on what it is saying is we see actually the bigger opportunity in changing our addressable market than necessarily acquiring more customers. Of course, like any business, we will acquire more customers and it will be a stream of our focus. But what I'd say is where we are placing more emphasis is how do we redraw the perimeter of our relevance for the customer, right? And offer things to them and, you know, and in creating the permission in the customer's mind and in the competitive landscape for us to play, for, the, for us to be considered, for us to be the preferred um, provider of those services. And even mathematically, the given, you know, you refer to telco land, telco land, if you just stick to telco land services is a 1% growth rate at, you know, in a generous world, right? But because of price pressure and so on and volumes, of course, it grows much faster. But the adjacent areas grow at, you know, the way we've defined our perimeter by 8%, right? So that's, the, that's where we want to play. And it's to the same customers that we are, but, you know, being something different to them. And a lot of what, you know, marketing has to do is seed the ground for us so that we can go into those um, uh, uh, areas and, and, and operate in fertile territory. That, that, that's interesting. This is, uh, this is a topic close to my heart. And as Iris know, we call this, this let's say, market definition. We, we, we talk about philosophy. If we see old performers taking a more abundant view of their market, so they don't focus so much on their, let's say, slice of the pie, but rather to increase the pie or even look at other pies. Um, and, uh, and, and Iris, uh, as we have discussed in the program, there's obviously many ways to do that. You can indeed look at adjacent categories. You can go from functional to emotional to societal benefits. To, uh, you can also ladder up in terms of the needs of, of people. So what is the most important, or you can work from a, a technological competency and, and, and see where you can apply that same competency. What is the most important road or let's say way for Vodafone business to, to indeed take a more abundant uh, view? Iris. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by most are, important. Are you, are you taking, looking at the customer needs and say, well, you can, you can ladder those up. Got it. Um, or you can say, well, um, we have a specific competency and we'll apply it just to Understand. markets. Yeah. I think, I think, Frank, it's a combination of all. We've mentioned a lot about the insight and, and, and the research we did on our customers, especially now when it comes to the smaller customers. Obviously, that really uh, affects uh, what we do. But we need to also look at what are our current capabilities, uh, where we can expand our current capabilities, how we can build the ecosystem together. And, and, and of course, we need to think about commercially as well, how we can grow with the new strategy. So I think it really needs to have a lot of different perspectives. You cannot just drive on one side from Maya. No, but where Iris and her team have been real conscience keepers for us internally has been on keeping us focused on the customer needs, right? And, and, and putting technology a little bit second. Um, because being an engineering company, we have lots of engineers, including people like me, we will go towards the, the technology very quickly and then the product, but they keep us grounded in this is the customer inside, this is the customer need. And sometimes it's a very qualitative need that you have to address through, yeah, using technology, but making technology in a very, you know, uh, um, very accessible. And um, so I, I'd say the uh, our expansion is driven more by customer need rather than, oh, we have a hammer and let's go look for the nails, which is probably where we used to be many years ago, but uh, no longer. I couldn't agree more with you. And it's By the way, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Actually, a really good example of what we not mentioned is, so last year, pandemic happened. And what we saw is actually our customers, especially the smallest one, they were absolutely the hardest hit. We built this digital advisory service for them. It, it is and, and it's free of charge, and it really helped them to establish themselves digitally. So we we are supported them in digital marketing, in security, 
a, a lot of different areas. Uh, we provided uh, our, um, calls like our phone uh, our call support, chat support, a lot of educational and training uh, 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 um, courses as well. And it's been wonderful to see kind of like, and this is, we saw the need of our customers and we reacted to it. And obviously from the kind of like onset, it doesn't bring us commercially anything, but it's really changed it for our customers, it really helped them. I actually just saw uh, the other week, one of our customers, they were commenting that it was a lifeline for them. So we did something because we saw the need for our customers and we knew from our research that there are a lot of customers who are not yet digitally savvy, the smaller businesses. Okay, Iris, this is a great example. Let's, because I said the essence here in this topic is obviously trade-offs that you make because you want to be customer centric, but you want to be commercially driven and it needs to be aligned to the purpose. Always a hard one. It's interesting what you said. This is a great, it sounds like totally the right thing to do. And you said, of course, it was for free and it didn't make commercially, it didn't make us money. How do you go about making those trade-offs? I mean, I can come up with a dozen other initiatives that won't make you any money, but will make customers really happy. How do you do that? How do you convince maybe Vinut or the CFO that this one is actually really worth doing it, although it doesn't bring in a penny of, and, and still be commercially driven? This actually came from Vinut. So Vinut was very driven in supporting our customers. In the end of the day, uh, uh, we've discussed about Vodafone and Vodafone business being purpose driven. So not everything you do uh, uh, can be uh, commercially driven, but obviously I think we all agree and, and marketing people especially know that when you change the perception of your customers, when you support your customers, in the end of the day, it supports your business as well. Now, just on that, uh, Frank, I want to bring something in and maybe challenge you um, somewhat, which is I don't, I, you know, personally, uh, one of the things that I love about Vodafone and why I work is I think, for-profit business does not have to sacrifice the interest of stakeholders. The prerequisite for that is to define the horizon when you expect economic benefit, right? So if you want, and, and also if you expect every transaction, every activity, every program to be commercially viable, then you know that's one way of running a business. I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm not trying to be saintly here. The other one is to say, you know what, I'm going to do things which are also right for the other stakeholders, right? I'm going to look beyond the immediate circumference of my business and look at what are the ripple effects that get created. I'm going to pay a little bit more attention to the larger community and the impact on society, on the planet. You can define the circle as wide as you want. And I firmly believe, and my experience over the years has shown that when you do that, actually the dividends that you get for the core commercial activity is quite cons considerable. And, and there is no better way to do, to get to that benefit, except that you have to be a bit patient. You have to be authentic. You can't go after everything, but what you say you should do and do it well, right? Then the, the circle does get completed and, and, and you can charge a premium from your customers. Your customers will be happy to pay for it because they know what you stand for. You, they, you know, they are more loyal and, and there's, there's p &L benefit, right? If you're, you're, you're just going to put the p &L hat on, but you just have to be more sort of, um, I won't say long, long-term view, but you have to know the time when <laughs> you, you should make the return on, on the investment and from where. No, I, I listen, I mean, you speak very much to my heart and to what the Institute for Real Growth really stands for, which is, we call this the Humanizing Growth Webinar, which is all about long-term value creation for all stakeholders, yeah. as opposed to short-term profit maximization just for the shareholders. But I think uh, that's, I mean, very few people will argue that that's a good idea. What a lot of people struggle with, and that's why I want to, uh, dig in a little bit deeper here is how do you make those decisions? It was very interesting that the example Iris mentioned that was that she was really proud about actually came from you, Vinut. So how does that work? Is it how do you make the decision? This service and this something with no immediate ROI, although I'm telling everybody to commercially driven. On this one, we go, you know. And then, yeah. How do you make the answer? I think the first and foremost, is I won't take credit for it because I may, I came up with sort of a, a way. I'll leave that to the two no, of no, 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 what I mean is 
and this is important. Uh, the point I'm making is not it. It I I may have triggered the solution and championed it. That's fine, but it actually came from listening to our customers, right? There's a human plea for help from SMEs that if we didn't listen to, right, we would uh, we would pay the price eventually, right? It, it would pay the price eventually because they won't exist as business. There'll be no one to sell to, right? That's one. So let's get real. You won't have a PNL if you know if they they weren't there. Therefore, we said okay. That's one. The second is we knew that if we responded to that plea for help, right, which is how do we digitize ourselves, there was an ability for us to enter into those concentric circles I spoke about, where we were not previously a player outside telco land products and services. So yes, it was definitely a response at a time in the week. Equally, we said, okay, here's an opportunity for us to make the brand recognized for something that we care for them, that we want to go on the journey for them. And if we do that, they will help us monetize, right? Why would they have to buy the technology anyway? They have to choose between different providers. They will choose both of them. So it was, I'm not being sort of naive about it, saying, ah, we will take care of them. And then, you know, we, we, we're just saying that we're not going to be greedy at a transactional level. We'll play it at the most strategic horizon. And that's how you make the decision. And you debate it internally. You take it to, to our, you know, to my peer group at a, at a group level and say, this is why we're doing it. And then everybody said, absolutely, yes. And then, you know, it's turned out to be a very successful program for us. But they'll, equally, I'll say there'll be other cases when you're setting, say, goals around how quickly you want to um, uh, decarbonize or, you know, anything else, right? And then you say, okay, there's a cost of this several hundreds of millions. How much of it can we absorb, right? Uh, and we will, you know, tighten our belts in some other areas and we will do it. And, but sometimes we might say, you know what, that's a bit too much. We're going to, you know, differ it by a year. But are we, the thing is intellectually to be honest to ourselves that we are directionally going towards a target and we're making steady progress year on year. Right? I think where companies can falter is when they set an ambitious target and think people have forgotten about it and don't do anything to take them on that journey. That's a hollow statement that will show, right? Luckily, you know, we're really blessed with an operationally intense company that anything that we take on, we break it down into boom, 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 you know, quarterly, weekly, functional, person level goals, even on all the purpose uh, agendas, because we deeply care for it. And we just want to make sure that what we say as words translates into action, even if the actions are small and will be a buildup over time. People, you know, the, the world around us is not stupid. They, they know we're commercially we have commercial profits to deliver for stakeholders, we listed companies and so on. But equally they're saying, okay, when you say something, show us intent, show us you know, intent backed by action. So that, that's clear. Iris, would you say on the back of what Vinu just said that, that at Photophone Business, you're really good at making the business case for well, let's call it purposeful actions or initiatives or, um, you know, addressing multi-stakeholder needs. Is that something, is commercially driven also something that you've translated in being able to make the business case for more humanized growth, if you will? Well, I think we not explained this uh, uh, quite uh, uh, well already, mm -hmm. but um, I think for us uh, at Vodafone, we don't think we don't think purpose, we feel and live purpose. So it's, it's not that we consciously do something, a business case for a purpose-driven initiative. We even uh, um, actually, we have a new uh, um, brand positioning and our new brand positioning together we can, it, it's really focusing on how the technology, yes, it enables uh, uh, the innovation technology, it enables change, but it's the human spirit in the end that matters. So even our brand positioning is very much related to our purpose, it's all intertwined. So I, I don't think we, we don't talk purpose, we, we feel purpose and we act on it. So it's not that we specifically think about, oh, um, how to make this business case out of this purpose-driven initiatives. We even have order home business ventures that are actually very purpose-driven in their activities. Uh, last year, they were very uh, prominent in connected education solutions, for example. But it's not something that we consciously talk every day. It is something we feel and we live. That's interesting. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of companies that would that, that want to know more about that. Talk less and feel and do more. 
what's the fuel for that, uh, Iris? So what's what's the fuel for the fact that you don't need to talk about it, that you feel it and do it? I I think one of the so I was talking to my peer in the consumer organization uh, this week, and as I said, we just launched this uh, um, a new brand positioning. And of, of course, from an external perspective, it's early days, but the fuel is that like how we, how our own people reacted to it. It's our own people loved it and they reacted very strongly to it. And I, I think that's the fuel. Our, every single person in this organization is the fuel. Every single person is the purpose. So the fuel is not something external. It's our people that fuels the purpose. Well, if I can just do a build on that. One is, I think there is, um, you know, it is mine, group exco and so on, seriousness behind the intent, right? So we, we you know, like I said, we, we can't promise the moon, but we know we, will, we want to get there. And then we'll show that, we, that we're making progress on that journey and people appreciate that. But after that, you know, in my, you know, 18, 20 months here in Vodafone, I've really been so um, inspired when people talk about purpose in every in meetings which have nothing to do with purpose, it's not like, okay, today we're going to do a review of our purpose agenda. We have three pillars, how we're we doing on that. We do that also, but but there'd be meetings with preparing for a customer meeting, all right? Or or just another session. And people weave in purpose with no prompting. And when that happens, right, I say, wow, that's cool, right? That means this is real, it's grassroots. It's not because I came into the meeting and say, guys, how is this linked to our planet purpose? Right. They just talk about it, right? And in a context you never even expected. And when you see that happening again and again and again, and it becomes kind of an ethos of the business, it also is something that the business demands, right? I've been called out in certain discussions saying, hey, that, you know, how is this fitting our purpose agenda? Or this is not ticking the box on our purpose agenda, right? Can you explain why is that the case? I love those kind of challenges, right? Yeah. Because then you know, Right? You have to explain it. You may have a reason for it. But when the challenge happens, you know that it's live in the business. It means it will live for a long time. Well, that's, that's definitely a, a situation that, and Iris knows that from our program, that many of the CMOs in our leadership program really aspire to, 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 to have that. And indeed, where you're being called out on, on purpose. Um, I think it's really interesting what you said, Iris. Our people are the purpose; they are the fuel. I think that's 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 very much what what you should uh, strive for. Um, to what extent, Vinod, does the purpose of the company overlap uh, with your own personal purpose? Oh, very strongly, right? Um, we um... did you ever articulate yours? Yeah, I have articulated my purpose uh, before, and and I'm, I'm you know one of the things that I'm champion for is uh, uh, I'm the executive sponsor for our race and ethnicity, which is part of our inclusion purpose, right? And um, and I feel really strongly about it personally. It's a, it's the reason why I've had a global uh, career. It's the reason why I've lived all over the world and worked all over the world and sought the jobs that I've taken. It's because I I like that environment. I like being distributed, I like, you know, and, and I have, you know, that's just, I have personal philosophies around it. And that's a real anchor point for me, right? Amongst our three things. The second one is on digital society, which is our business. And it's very, you know, I've been in this industry for 30 years. I care about it deeply. And the third one is on planet, right? Um, and the one that I feel the strongest about is, um, is in the inclusion piece, because, you know, there's a social justice element to it. There's a strength, you know, there's a logic to it because of cognitive diversity strengthens any outcome. So I'm willing to carry that flag on behalf of the company and roll up my sleeves and figure things out because it matters to me a lot. So when you fight for that, and, and I saw your whole strategy that is, you know, all SDG based, you selected four SDGs, this ties into that as well. Um, it feels very and yeah, I mean, to Iris' point, if the people are the fuel and the strategy is, is the umbrella, it, it, it seems you've got it pretty clearly worked out. Still, even in such a situation, there's always, you can always do more. There's, yeah, there's, of course. So how do you make that trade-off? I'm, I'm just 
personally interested and intrigued by how people make those decisions. It's almost like how much do you, do you give to a charity that comes collecting at your door? Do you put in a $10 bill or a $20 bill? Hard to rationalize, but how do you navigate personally those where do you say, you know what, I'm going to bang my fist one more time because this is so important and where and when and where do you back off? How do you navigate that? Well, one is this, it's a collective uh, process, right? You can't have any uh, one individual laws, you know, only groups of individuals banging their fists on the table because then with everybody's own personal purposes and the company's purpose, there'll be <laughs> lots of noise <laughs> with uh, fist banging. And, 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 but, but the important thing is to have an environment where people can bang their fist and say, you really need to hear this, guys, right? This is important. And then you also, you, you know, there are economic interests. We are a listed company. We have to show steady increase in profits and so on. And there are times when you say, you know, that is, it would be great if we could do that, but we can't afford it, right? And, but the key thing is, are we doing, so, have, we look, have we looked at every, um, in every corner to see, are there non-financial impacts that we can, you know, or non-financial inputs that we can make to actually stand up? So it can be what we stand for as a company. Our brand is powerful. When we, you know, drive advocacy around something, people stand up and listen, right? So it doesn't always mean taking a checkbook out. So as a leadership team and as leaders, we need to make sure that we've exhausted every avenue to see if we can make an impact, right? And then where we can actually redirect resources, we redirect resources, and then. We need to make sure that where we redirect financial resources, that they're being put into things that really matter. It's not on external talk and so on. There's you know, real contribution and let that contribution speak for itself rather than the headlines speak for themselves. Right. It's, it's no simple answer, it's, but and no, we, no, have, no. we have big arguments on, on this and what we can afford, what we can't. But I usually find that if we think really hard about it, there is something that we can do, right? that makes a difference. It can be thought leadership contribution, giving our people's times. It can be, you know, working in partnership with customers, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, Iris, you said uh, our, our people are, are, are the, the fuel to the purpose. And, and so you will be that as well. Um, what, can you give an example of where you, and I don't mean sacrifice, right, but, but where you really, did go the extra mile because because you felt personally you iris felt that this was a, like finut says i have a clear focus area which is all around equality and inclusion is there an, an intervention that you did an action that you took recently we said yeah, that was my personal fuel and it completely aligned with with the company's purpose oh that's a really good question um i think Overall, and, and this is not just recently, but this is overall, I, I think the focus uh, uh, um, really needs to be on diversity and we, we not talks about the inclusion and diversity and, and I think that's something that's been very much my focus and I, I drive that within my team, we have a lot of discussions about that one as well. Uh, and, and also what I personally uh, think we really need to think about diversity. Quite often you, you talk about female and male, so it's a gender, or, or then it's, uh, uh, we not mentioned ethnicity and race, but also we need to include all sorts of diversity, including disability. And that's something that we actually, um, and I hopefully my team member don't mind about this one, she was driving it and, and I allowed her to drive so that actually in our advertising, we also show people from all sorts of diversity. And I was really proud of her. Um, I allowed her to try that initiative, but I, I think that's kind of like, you need to not just kind of like show it internally, but then you need to express the same thoughts and ideas and, and then everything externally as well. You need to be true to yourself. Yeah, yeah, completely see that. Um, so, Obviously, what I've seen and, and what we've seen in our study is that with the pandemic happening, that the shift in terms of stakeholder focus was very clearly shareholders have always been, you know, very high on the on the on the radar, very clearly on the radar, as were customers. But actually, colleagues and communities became the prime focus right when the pandemic hit. We're now a bit over a year into this situation. Is that changing? Do you, do you see that 
or is the change that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic here to stay, Vinod? Well, I, I think the change is here to stay, but you know what? When I look at different stakeholders, right, I feel what the pandemic has established is a tight linkage between the stakeholders and people recognizing the change, right? Even shareholders, when you speak to them now, are asking us questions about how you work with policymakers, how you help, help uh, governments during this period, you know, what, what is your journey with customers going forward? So there's much more empathy and sensitivity to those things uh, than before. If you talk with our customers, right, our, uh, our, uh, our uh, consumer customers want to know what we've done for the communities that they operate in, right? What, what, and they want to know, the consumers are asking us, what have you done for SMEs? Because we want the neighborhood baker to still have their business going. I, you know, we still want, you know, who was the ha hairdresser there, the business to survive and have an online capability. So these linkages are becoming much more not only explicit but apparent to to each other the other players and they're caring for it they're nurturing for it now some of this of course is because we're in a, in a let's say a high pressure uh, situation and and uh, uh, we're more alert to this but i believe that it, it will stay yeah. yeah yeah iris anything to add there from your end uh, no, I, I, I think it's quite, it just reminded me, I, I, uh, I uh, took an Uber the other day and, and the taxi driver was saying to me, people are talking about the new normal, but it's the normal, it's not the new normal. It's just it, uh, reminded me of that discussion when we not said, I think we need to think about this as a normal. However, I echo, we not, I, I really believe that there's really a renewed focus uh, on people and, 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 and empathy. And we not mentioned consumers and, and our businesses as well. We see it, uh, that our businesses have much more focus on sustainability. And, and, and Frank, you mentioned it as well on communities. I think it's the emotional intelligence uh, that's really and the humility that's coming through. Um, but also we talk so much about resilience nowadays. And I think we've all exhausted our resilience uh, over the past year. But I think it's important for us to sometimes just cut ourselves some slack as well and be kind to ourselves. Yeah, so, so if this is the, the, the normal, what is it that's, that's in this year, but moving forward as a leader, Iris, that's, that you feel that you've started to develop and need to develop even more because this is the normal and it's not a temporary or a new situation. I think what we did last year uh, uh, um, is, is quite like sometimes in, in big organizations, developing something new and, and thinking outside of the box, it can become like it takes months and, 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 and processes are slow. And what we realized last year is actually, like I mentioned this VHUB, the digital advisory service, we launched it in a couple of months. So when we want, we can really be agile and we can also find the positive in the adversity. So I think that is something that a muscle, so to say, that I want to develop even further myself and my team is really seeing the art of the possible and, and acting agile way, being flexible. Like, like quite often we are like developing something for months and months and months, then launching and all that. Now I think we need to be more flexible and seeing like, okay, let's try this, didn't work. Let's try something else. So I think this is something that really kind of like was heightened last year. And I definitely want to focus more on that. Yeah, I, I really like that. It's uh, that's, that's a beautiful uh, ambition. I think it plays completely into indeed what the reality is that not only you, but many of our viewers will have experience. And it's a, it's a great aspirational objective for, for, for I think for everybody here. Um, I, I mean, listen, I've got a ton of other questions. We could have gone on for much longer, uh, but it's really nice. I mean, in this hour, I got a sense that I can also see why you as a duo function so well together, because I feel your energy and your drive and passion, Iris, but I see also, Vinod, how you are really clearly, you know, taking a view from an aggregated level where you can see where all these different components and this, action orientation so fits in into a bigger picture that, that you have a very clear 
clear view of and that you also I think uh, sh you know shared in a very clear and compelling way with with our viewers and, and I want to thank you for that I want to thank you both for that and uh, to the viewers I would say uh, great that you were here um, one last thing to say before we go is that um, you can always send the uh, or share the recording and the write-up or the audio tape of this uh, conversation with, with colleagues, just go to the website of Institute for Real Growth. And I would like to welcome you in two weeks when I'm uh, having as a guest Lubomira Rocher. She is the um, she's an executive uh, board member of L'Oreal and she is the chief digital uh, officer um, and, uh, and L'Oreal is a clear front runner in that space. So it should make for another great conversation with that, I want to thank you, wish you a fantastic weekend, and uh, take good care, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you, Iris. Bye. Bye-bye.